I have just had the honor, and I mean that word sincerely, the honor of preaching to this great church family here. That's the pulpit. Actually, tonight I stood in front of the pulpit and talked, preached a whole sermon about Jesus, our Savior. But service is over. And it's time to open our Bibles again to the book of Nehemiah. We're in Nehemiah chapter number two. This is our first lesson, in fact, in chapter two. And uh, how will I say it? The story continues. In, in, in essence, the book of Nehemiah is a story about a man named Nehemiah. And he saw a need. God laid that need on his heart. And I'll declare, he became a great leader in Israel. God used him and his life to meet that existing need. All of that in good time. The story continues. In fact, let me say something by introduction. In reality, the whole Bible is a story. The whole Bible gives us a narrative, a trajectory of truth about the ultimate goal, the old rugged cross, Old Testament as well as new, and our Savior who died there to bring salvation to you and to me. The story in the Bible. The book of Genesis, for example. I don't want to spend long on this. It's a story. Here is the book of Genesis in a few words. Four events and four lives. Four events and four lives. What are the events, preacher? Creation, the fall of mankind, the flood because of sin, and the Tower of Babel. Uh, that man built and God frustrated four events. And then four, by the way, those four events, Genesis 1 through 11, chapters 1 through 11. Four lives, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. That'd be chapters 12 through 50. I'm saying all that to say the book of Genesis is a story, true story. The book of Nehemiah is a story. The whole Bible is a story about our dear Savior. And what's so important, preacher, about Nehemiah's story? The nation of Israel. God's chosen people. The book of Esther centers around that nation. Book of Nehemiah centers around that nation. In some ways, back to Genesis, it centers around that nation nation because God is always going to bless his people. They may disobey, they may rebel, God may punish them, but he's always going to bless his people Israel through whom he brought Jesus into the world. He has plans yet for the nation of Israel. Listen to this, Zechariah chapter 2 verse 8. He that touches you it says, God talking to Israel. He that harms you. He that assaults you. He that touches you, Israel, touches the apple of my eye. God says, touching Israel, you're touching the apple of my eye. Let me interpret. You're touching my sensitive spot. You're touching something dear to my heart. And you will not harm Israel and escape Israel. The judgment of Almighty God. A story in the Bible. Well, the first five verses, and that's our target tonight. Nehemiah 2, 1 through 5, also continue a story. Let me read you the story. That's the place to begin. Verse 1. I'm going to read through verse 5 consecutively. And it came to pass, Nehemiah writes to us, and it came to the pass in the month Nisan, N-I-S-A-N, 
in the 20th year of Artaxerxes the king, that wine was before the king. And Nehemiah says, I took up the wine. Let me give you a synonym for took up. I served the wine and gave it unto the king. Now, verse 1 ends. Now, I had not been before time sad in his presence. I had never been sad in the presence of the king. Why is Nehemiah sad? Jerusalem is in ruins. The walls of the city have been broken down. The gates have been burned. There's no protection for that city. And uh, my countenance, therefore, countenance facially was sad. Verse 2. Wherefore, the king noticed it. The king said unto me, Why is thy countenance sad? Are you sick? I don't think so. Seeing thou art not sick, this is nothing else but sorrow of heart. Nehemiah, you're my cupbearer. You're in my employ. You come before me consistently, regularly, daily. And you're not supposed to be grievous or sad. And what I'm saying is none else but sorrow of heart. Then Nehemiah said, he makes a confession. Then was I very sore afraid. Why was he afraid? Because you don't displease an oriental king. It could lead to your life being extinguished. It could lead to your death. Then was I very sore afraid. Now, let me read verse 3. And I said unto the king, narrative, a story is being told. Then I said unto the king, let the king live forever. Why should not my countenance be sad when the city, ah, oh, we're getting somewhere now, when the city, the place of my father's sepulchers, the place where my forefathers are buried, lieth waste, and the gates thereof are consumed with fire. Nehemiah has had the nerve to unload his heart to the king of Persia, just as well say to the most powerful man on earth during those days. Mm. And uh, 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 let me read verse number four. Uh, then the king said unto me, for what dost thou make request? This is looking good for Nehemiah. Then the king said unto me, can I paraphrase? What do you need? What do you want? How can I help you solve uh, the problem of your homeland lying in waste and being in ruins? How can I help? What dost thou make request? And then listen to the end of verse 4. It's a beautiful line of scripture. So I prayed to the God of heaven. That's Nehemiah's response. What do you need, Nehemiah? So I prayed to the God of heaven. We've already learned in our few short lessons, Nehemiah is a man of prayer. We find prayer is a subject being practiced 12 times in the book of Nehemiah. Here he shoots a quick prayer heavenward. Then I prayed to the God of heaven. Verse 5 immediately. And I said unto the king, if it please the king, that's good manners. That's the way you talk to a king. If it please the king, and if thy servant has found favor in your sight, if I have found good will in your sight, that thou wouldest send me to Judah. Nehemiah can't just walk out on his job serving the king. No, no, no. That would be going A-W-O-L, absence without permission, absence without leave. Uh, that could lead to imprisonment or worse. He can't do that. So if it please the king, if thy servant has found favor or grace, that you would send me to Judah... 
under the city of my father's graves, my father's sepulchers, that I may build that city, that I might build those walls. Now, I wish we could go further into chapter 2. We can't go past verse 5. Time will not allow it. Uh, uh, in our next lesson, verse 6 and onward, uh, it's a beautiful, beautiful story. But for now, those first five verses. Let's start with a few comments on verse 1. Came to pass in the month Nisan. The time markers in the book of Nehemiah are important. They're significant. The last time we had a time marker, it was the month Kislu, back in chapter 1, the month Kislu, and, and uh, that corresponds to November, December of our calendar. Now, we are in the month Nisan. That corresponds to March, April in our calendar. So we immediately know this. Four months now have transpired. It's been four months since Nehemiah learned the city of Jerusalem is in shambles. The returning uh, uh, Jews that have been released from Babylon, uh, from Persia, I now should say, uh, they have managed to rebuild a temple. It's smaller, not as glorious, but it's a place to worship God. They put God first, but the city, walls are still ruined. And uh, four months has elapsed before Nehemiah brings the matter to the attention of the king. Still the same year. In the 20th year of Artaxerxes the king, 445 B.C. Four, we know the exact date, 445 B.C. And uh, he says, wine uh, was before him. I took up wine to the king. I gave it to the king. We learned at the end of last lesson, Nehemiah is the king's cupbearer. It was his duty. I'm not going to go back and reteach that. Uh, most of you have seen it. If not, go back and look. It was his duty to serve wine to the king when mealtimes arrived. That means Nehemiah knows the king personally. He's around him a good bit of the time. Uh, they are not merely uh, uh, socially uh, uh, distance acquainted. They are close acquaintances. Even to the point the king can sense the mood of uh, Nehemiah, he is serving wine to the king. Also, I, I read this. Let me share it with you real quick. In the first month of the year, Nisan, that uh, uh, March, April, that's the first month uh, of the year uh, chronologically. In that month, they often held a great banquet. Uh, a banquet similar to the one that was held at the beginning of the book of Esther, lavish. Hundreds of people in attendance. It would last for weeks at a time. This may be one of those joyous banqueting occasions. And Nehemiah is doing his job, loyally performing his job. But I was sad before the king now, I had not been before time sad in his presence. I'll tell you this much. You are, if you're going to be in the presence of a king, an ancient king, an autocrat, a dictator, a despot, and this king's all of these, you better not have a frown on your face. You better reflect joy and delight in the presence of the king. I wish I had time to do this. I don't. In Psalm 16, it is a psalm about our Savior. We often call it the resurrection psalm. Uh, we see uh, the death of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus at the end of Psalm 16. And then the ascension of Jesus. He goes by, Father, in thy presence. Anybody believe the heavenly Father's a king? He's the king of kings. In thy presence is fullness of joy. In the presence of our great king is fullness of joy. At that right hand, 
uh, 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 pleasures forevermore, fullness of joy. Even in the great king, joy is expected on faces. And with the person king, you better have joy or you could be thrown into prison. And Nehemiah realizes he's sad before the presence of the king. Dangerous situation. Why is Nehemiah sad? His homeland. The burden of his heart is reflecting itself on his countenance, on his face. Verse 2. Verse 2. Wherefore, the king said unto me, say they're on a conversational basis, why is thy countenance sad? Uh, let me give you that word for sad, both in verse 1 and it's repeated in verse 2. Raw. It is spelled R A. It is spelled R A H. It is most often the word for sin, wickedness in the Hebrew tongue. But it is also uh, the word that can indicate affliction, heavy, heavy burden uh, that somebody is carrying. That's its sense here. The king said, Why is your countenance sad? If you wanted to be literal in the word raw, why do you have a bad face? Why are you not reflecting joy and smiles in the king's banquet at the king's meal time? Why are you sad? Seeing thou art not sick, and the word for sick means diseased, weak, even wounded. Uh, are you sick, Nehemiah? I think not. I see no sign that you are sick. So I've come to a conclusion. This is nothing else but sorrow of heart. This is nothing else but sorrow. And it's raw again. Sorrow of heart. Deep down inside. Sorrow in your heart. You're discouraged. You're depressed. You can't be depressed around the king. Uh, he, he, and then Nehemiah immediately adds, then was I very sore afraid. I cannot tell you, I don't know how to describe the degree in which the Hebrew language there uh, describes Nehemiah's, and I'm just going to use the word, it's accurate, terror. Uh, very sore afraid. Very is meod. It means to a great extent. Sower is rabah. It means multiplied again and again and again. And then for afraid, yare, it's spelled Y-A-R-E. It means trembling, petrified. That absolute. Nehemiah says, oh, I've let my burden show on my face and the king has noticed it. Oh, I pray. I pray he doesn't throw me in jail. I, I pray my life is not coming out. I want to go to Jerusalem and help in the crisis there. I was very sore afraid. Verse number three. And I said unto the king, and I said unto the king, let the king live forever. Let the king live forever. Preacher, what kind of talk is that? Get this word. It's protocol. It's proper court etiquette. Uh, if the president of the United States were to walk into a, a room, uh, he would be addressed as Mr. President. Prime Minister of Israel, Mr. Prime Minister. Terms of respect. And one of the terms of respect for a person king, let the king live forever. May, may God give you long life. May God smile upon you with blessings. King Nehemiah becomes extremely blunt at great risk in verse 3. Why? Should not my countenance be sad? Why should not my countenance be sad? And there, we change a little bit, it's back to y'all read the word for fear, trembling, quivering. Why should not my lips be quivering? When the city, ah, 
when the city, and the word that is used there for city is ear. It's spelled I-Y-R, ear. This might be worth a few seconds. The word ear, I-Y-R, uh, in Hebrew, um, how am I going to put it? It means seven times. It is translated town. Comes from a root verb that means to arouse, to wake up, not to be lethargic or sleepy. How did that verb, to arouse, to be awake, come to mean uh, uh, the noun city? Because in a city, people congregate. They're always busy. Always somebody coming and going. Uh, there is never, the city is always awake. There's always a time somebody's plying their trade and performing their job. Here's why I'm sad, King, because the city, the place of my father's sepulchers, uh, the word there for uh, sepulchers, 35 times it is translated grave in our King James Old Testament, sepulchers. Oh, let's, let's deal with that a minute. I want you to notice Nehemiah did not immediately say because the city of Jerusalem lieth in waste. Jerusalem has got a bad reputation with the Babylonian and the Persian kings all the way back to 586 BC when Jerusalem rebelled against the governments, the powers that be. They rebelled against Babylon. And the city of Jerusalem, in fact, back in the book of Ezra chapter 4, there were some enemies of the Jews who gave a bad report to the Persian king and the Persian king stopped all work on the temple back in the day before Nehemiah went down to uh, the city of Jerusalem. Jerusalem may have a bad taste in the mouth of the king. So initially, uh, uh, Nehemiah does not use the word Jerusalem. He said, the city where my fathers, the city where my fathers uh, are, I've lost my place. The city, where, the place where my father's sepulchers lie. It lieth waste, it's destroyed. And the gates thereof are consumed with fire. Why would he say the city where my fathers, my forefathers are buried? While the Persian monarchy may not think an awful lot about the city of Jerusalem at the moment, they have a deep reverence for the burial grounds, the grave sites of one's forefathers. And Nehemiah is wise enough, discerning enough, has prudence enough to know to approach the king, to get some help, to rebuild the walls. It can't be done without help from some uh, wealthy outside uh, 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 authority, and that's going to be the king. Uh, my father's sepulchers lie at the waste. The gates are consumed with fire. The story continues. Nehemiah has said a lot. He's gone out on a limb. Could be risking his very life. But king, that's why I am sad. Verse number four. And the king said unto me, we're in on a conversation between the king of Persia and his cupbearer. And the king said unto me, for what dost thou make thy request? He almost says this. What do you need? The word there for request, for what? The, bakas, B-A-Q-A-S-H. And it means to seek 189 times. What do you need? What are you seeking? What are you asking for, Nehemiah? Uh, it means to beg one time. Nehemiah, beg if you need to. Tell me what the need is. And as soon as Nehemiah hears those words, so I prayed quickly, Few words, obviously. So I prayed to the God of heaven. Nehemiah's got a split few seconds where he's got to put an answer before the king. And so he prays quickly. Lord, help me. He prays quickly. Lord, 
I need wisdom. That is called by the old timers, way back to the age of the Puritans. Listen to this, an ejaculatory prayer. I, I saw somebody as I was preparing for the lesson, uh, they called it a telegram prayer, a short prayer. Hey, I'll give you a short prayer in the New Testament. Peter's walking on the water. He looks at the waves and the wind rather than Jesus. He begins to sink. Here's his prayer. Lord, save me. Lord, save me. Jesus reached out his hand and saved Peter. If Peter had prayed a long prayer, he would have drowned. If Nehemiah had prayed a long prayer, the king might have lost interest. God, help me. God, get. So I prayed to the God of heaven. The time and time again, we'll show you throughout the book of Nehemiah those quick prayers, those quick prayers, those instant prayers, those immediate prayers. I prayed to the God of heaven. And then I said to the king, then I said to the king, listen to this, if it please the king, if it please the king. And, and here's the word, here's the construction, if it please the king. Tob, T-O-B, if it seems good to the king, if it bring, brings pleasure, no matter what Nehemiah is asking for, he will show honor, good manners, proper behavior toward the king. If it please the king and if thy servant, he uses the word ebed, E-B-E-D, uh, and it is the word for slave, I'm merely your cupbearer. If I have found favor in your sight, if I have found grace in your sight, if I am acceptable, oh, I remember talking to the king of kings, if I found grace in your sight, if you'd extend your mercy, save my soul from hell, and I found grace in the eyes of king of kings, and Nehemiah found grace in favor in the sight of the king. Here's what I'm asking. Would you send me would you dispatch me? Would you allow me? Would you give me a leave of absence to go down to the city of my forefathers? Eventually, Jerusalem will come out, but after the king's heart has been won. Would you let me go to the city of my forefathers? And would you let me uh, rebuild those walls and repair those gates under the city of my father's sepulchers that I may build it. The verb is bana, that I may build the city of my forefathers. I want to go and I want to build. I want to rebuild the city of my forefathers. I'm asking permission to go. Nehemiah has been said. Grace has been extended. The king says, what do you want? And Nehemiah boldly let us come boldly before the throne of Christ. Nehemiah boldly tells the king, Sir, if it pleases you, would you give me leave of absence to return to the land of my forefathers? Somebody said this. Here, Nehemiah is a great man of faith. He had faith to wait and he had faith to ask. He waited four months. By the way, short prayer, that short prayer is not going to do it. For four months, Nehemiah's been praying, fasting, seeking God's touching power. Four month interval. Then it's time to ask. The day has arrived. God, king, monarch, despot, would you grant the request and let me go. Somebody said this quickie prayer, this telegram, it's a high watermark in the history of Bible prayer. Listen to this. The, the land of my forefathers, somebody said this, write it down. Nehemiah is building on the past so Israel can have a future. Nehemiah is building on the past so Israel can have a future future. Nehemiah waited till just the right time. He waited over a hundred days. He waited four months. Somebody said this, waiting time is not wasted time when God Almighty is in it. Psalm 27 14, wait on the Lord. Be of good courage. He'll strengthen you. If we'll wait right, we can ask right and God will send the answer. Nehemiah's soon going to be on the way.